One world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special broadcast, special edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. Today's special broadcast, uh, as promised, is going to be about the occult aspects of 9-11. And uh, I had my guest, who I'm going to be speaking with today, Mark Passio, on my show on Friday, August 24th, 2012, and we were talking about the Matrix trilogy, and we were decoding it uh, for the listeners, and we just did not have enough time to get into the occult aspects of 9-11 and even though Mark is super, super busy getting ready for the Free Your Mind conference coming up next April, in uh, April 2013, Free Your Mind uh, conference part two, and he's organizing it and he's putting a ton of his personal time into it, he's been gracious enough to take a, an extra hour at least out of his uh, day to sit with me and go over the occult aspects of 9-11. And obviously even one hour is not long enough to go over everything, and I know Mark's got presentations on this stuff, so uh, during the broadcast and uh, at the end, I will make sure we plug his website and where you can go see his full breakdowns in uh, intricate detail on all of this stuff. So without wasting any more time, let me bring up my guest, and let's get right into the subject matter at hand. Mark, welcome back to the broadcast. Popeye, thanks so much for inviting me back for a special broadcast on the occult aspects of 9-11. A pleasure to be here. So 9-11. People that are awake know that there's questions about it. You know, the, the story, the government's official story, the, the hijackers, all this other stuff. But what a lot of people don't know is there's a lot of occult symbolism behind the whole event itself. And I that really plays a major part in what happened because of the controllers behind the scenes are the ones that... Uh, believe in it. It doesn't matter whether or not these people, you know, the the mass general public or any of us really believe that these people worship Satan and, or Lucifer and, uh, you know, they go around and they do sacrifices and even something as grand as 9-11 being a sacrifice. Not many people, I, I think when you say that, you know what I mean? If you say that to the general public, it's like a, you know, to them it sounds crazy and kooky. And at first, I have to admit, years ago, uh, I had heard something about this, and I was like, meh, I don't know. But being the ever-inquisitive person that I am, I decided, well, I, I, if it's crap, I'll go find out and see if it's crap. If it isn't crap, then I need to talk about it. And the more I investigated it, the more it just blew my mind. So 
I'm going to shut up and give you the floor. I'll frame it with this. 9-11 obviously was a, a massive event where there was a lot of spiritual energy and everything released from the people that were dying. Yes. Was that a huge part of the event itself? Was that one of the reasons for it? That was the main reason for it. Um energy release plays into the belief systems of these individuals. They believe that they're going to direct that energy, use it for their purposes, their agenda, and it's going to lead to the manifestation of their desires. What we're talking about here is a mass human sacrifice ritual. That's what 9-11 really was. And I call it an example of chaos sorcery which is an application of the Hegelian dialectic on a mass scale, uh, bloodletting uh, given to the earth um, for the purposes of, again, absorption of that energy and then directing it uh, you know, toward the agenda uh, that the, the, the magician or sorcerer, if you will, that's behind this event, the, the, the dark occultist magicians that actually orchestrated this entire thing, what they want to see manifested in the world. This is part of the direction of that agenda through an, uh, a huge injection into the mass consciousness of trauma and fear. And that's one of the main underlying reasons for uh, this agenda. I mean, that's deeper than even the simple political reasons or the quote-unquote inside job uh, reasons that are often uh, cited for why they conducted such an event. But... Um, People have to understand that when you're talking about uh, sick, twisted religious fundamentalism like this, you don't need to believe in the concepts or ideas that are being discussed to um, uh, understand that a group of people out there does deeply believe in these things and is willing to act upon them. So the idea that people will often come up with is, oh, I don't want to hear any of that uh, stuff about the occult, I don't believe in that, is that that notion is completely irrelevant because there are other people in the world who do deeply believe in these things and are acting on them. I give the example all the time that you don't need to believe in right-wing religious uh, Christian fundamentalism for that to have an impact in your life because there is a segment of people that are uh, in that belief system and are willing to act within that belief system and they can do things that are harmful that can affect you. They can uh, influence governments and then that can affect you. Um, they, you know, I, I give the example like, uh, you know, radical right-wing Christians can shoot up an abortion clinic because they don't agree with the practice of abortion and you can get caught in the crossfire walking on the street or sit, seated in, a, in, a, in an establishment, standing in an establishment next door to the clinic and, and uh, you know, stray fire hits you. Your life can be affected by other people's belief systems. You don't need to believe in the same things they believe in for uh, events to be uh, conducted or orchestrated according to those beliefs and affect your life. So I want to make that very clear before we start looking into uh, two different occult aspects of this event, namely the symbolism and the numerology of the event. And these are two things that d dark occultists are obsessed with. Uh, and these people are in the highest positions of power in every earthly institution on this planet. They're directing the agendas of every earthly institution and they totally are absorbed and their agendas are actually conducted according to symbolism and numbers. And hopefully when I explain some of those aspects of 9-11, people will see it more clearly and recognize that this is, these are some of the, the, the underlying beliefs that are driving these people's, uh, motivating these people's uh, actions. So uh, people uh, have often looked at 9-11 and as an example of the Hegelian dialectic, as it is known. Uh, simple dialectics is all about creating false choice or creating conflict so that you can come out on top through the management of that conflict, okay? Um, it is often called problem-reaction-solution. I believe that term was coined by the researcher David Icke. 
I call it chaos sorcery. That's my personal name for it because I distinguish it from a concept known as magic, which is about positive influence on consciousness, whereas sorcery is about the negative influence on consciousness uh, to direct the outcome toward the personal ego-driven will of the practitioner. You're using chaos to do that. You're using a chaotic, traumatic event in order to do that, to create that influence. So hence my term for this, which is chaos sorcery. The Hegelian dialectic needs to just be simply understood, uh, and I'm I'm going to have uh, we're going to have some slides that go along with the video that you can um, uh, edit with the video uh, for this podcast. I have 22 slides prepared, so I'll refer to you know uh, the slides as we go. Um, the Hegelian dialectic is simply defined as a framework for guiding thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to synthetic solutions which can only be introduced once those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so we could just simply break it down. You're guiding someone's thoughts and actions into conflicts. This is all about conflict resolution, okay? And the, the solution is synthetic. The solution to the conflict is synthetic, okay? It's based on a synthesis. The Hegelian dialectic has often been referred to as thesis meeting antithesis to create a synthesis, an artificial conflict resolution. That's the synthesis that we're talking about, which in other words is the predetermined agenda that the person who's orchestrating the whole thing wants to get to in the end. It's their outcome, their end game. And they couldn't get to it they couldn't get to that end game unless the people they're manipulating are actually taking a side, one side or another, because conflict needs to be created in order to get to that outcome. So that's what dialectics is actually all about. It's the creation of a false choice or a false opposition, okay, fake controlled opposition, so that the manipulator uh, acts as the manager of that conflict and comes out on top in the end and gets their agenda manifested. So this is, again, what 9-11 was really ultimately all about, an example of the Hegelian dialectic in action on a mass scale. We're going to look at something even deeper than just the dialectic aspect of 9-11, which is the symbolism, the occult symbolism that was employed as part of the event, and we're going to look at the numerology, the occult numerology that was also uh, everywhere, uh, all over, the fingerprints of which are all over the event. So three major occult traditions need to be understood at at least a um, cursory level in order to grasp the symbolism that we saw play out on 9-11. You have to have an understanding that the occult simply means hidden knowledge, that which is hidden from the Latin occultare, the verb meaning to hide or to conceal. To think of the occult as simply something that is evil is wrong. It is knowledge that is not common knowledge, that is basically um, uh, kept by the initiates of any given tradition, the inner circle, so to speak. It is esoteric knowledge, knowledge that is not commonly known by the masses. It's not common sense awareness. What we're trying to do is make the occult common sense awareness, make it known, de-occult it. I look at myself as a de-occultist. I'm trying to take that which is hidden, bring it out into the light of day so that people can understand it and hence understand how they're being manipulated by that knowledge. So the other thing to understand is that these traditions that I'm going to be talking about, the three traditions connected with the symbolism of 9-11, which is the Kabbalistic tradition, okay, the tradition of Kabbalah, the Tarot tradition, and the tradition of Freemasonry are in no way in and of themselves inherently bad. These traditions had an esoteric original intent, okay, they are traditions about human consciousness and how they work and how we can come to a better understanding of our own 
selves and our own consciousness and what our deeper underlying motivations and drives are really all about. It's, these traditions are ultimately to learn about the human psyche and to improve oneself so that one can come to a higher level of awareness regarding events that are going on not only in the world but within oneself and ultimately learn about the laws of the cosmos that are in place that we have to make it our goal to bring our understanding into alignment with such that we do not create self-inflicted suffering here on earth for ourselves. And ultimately, uh, the understanding of these traditions is intended to better our situation in our lives and uh, globally just better the human condition. Each one of these traditions has a light and a dark side. The light side, again, is that original esoteric intent that I just spoke about. The dark side is the perversion of that original tradition, the hoarding of that knowledge instead of the communication of that knowledge widely and freely, and then using that knowledge for selfish, egoic benefit and using it as a power differential advantage over others who are in ignorance of that knowledge. That is what I consider the hallmarks of the dark occult. So these traditions can also be inverted or used in a perverse way, which they were never originally intended to be used as. These are simply symbolic traditions. Uh, they contain symbolism. They contain uh, uh, number uh, information about archetypal knowledge. And they were originally, again, intended for the uplift of consciousness. Again, they have a dark application when one has fallen into a level of ego and base consciousness such that uh, the, their, the intention is to use it for control. Obviously, the 9-11 event is the, the latter situation there. It's um, taking the, the orchestrators of this event are taking these traditions and they are perverting them and using the symbolism and the, the numerology of these different traditions in a perverse way to control, to manipulate, and ultimately to bring in their selfish, uh, ego-driven agenda, which is ultimately the enslavement of humanity and uh, it's the, the shutting down of human consciousness and the shutting down of human care. That's ultimately what this entire ritual was all about. It was a mass human sacrifice ritual. I consider it, as we will see, a mass goddess sacrifice ritual, and it's a mass cremation of care ritual. That's what I was about to ask you. Would, would you consider 9-11 to be uh, a, a huge and epically sized version of what they do at Bohemian Grove every year? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll see those sacred feminine aspects, the attacks on and the destruction of those sacred feminine aspects as we break down some of the symbolism. Um, it is also a trauma-based mind control ritual because this was repeat. the images of this event were repeated over and over and over again, traumatizing the human psyche and softening it up for the, again, uh, political agendas that were to come, like uh, going into other countries and pillaging their resources, claiming that they're responsible when, in fact, inside agencies of intelligence departments and, you know, um, other agency, uh, black ops agencies within government were really, truly responsible. And um, uh, also the other agenda is simply for an attack on rights to claim, oh, now that this horrible event happened, we need to keep everybody safe. So you need to give up your, uh, you know, civil rights to us so that we can keep you safe, quote unquote, ostensibly. You know, that that's their, um, you know, their claim, but really it's all about just shutting down an open society and turning it into a totalitarian police state. That's the other uh, political agenda. Uh, but ultimately what's going on at a higher level is this is an agenda regarding the destruction of consciousness, care, and the infusion of negative energy into the field of consciousness that's all around us. And these, these uh, entities that ultimately I believe this um, uh, sacrifice ritual was offered up to are feeding on that energy. Uh, we're talking about a higher level of awareness when we talk about these occult aspects of the event and higher level uh, 
higher dimensional reasons for the um, the orchestration of this event. So it's ultimately all about put, shutting consciousness down through fear. And that is the perverse application of these three occult traditions we're going to be talking about. To understand how this symbolism is going to work, we first, of course, and this listenership will be well aware that three buildings came down in New York City on that day, not two. Of course, Building 7, uh, known as the Solomon Brothers Building, was also brought down at uh, 5.30 in the afternoon on 9-11-2001, 47-story steel frame building. That's critical to understand that there are three high-rise structures in New York City that were brought down on that day. And the reason for that is because the traditions we're going to be talking about all have three pillars or um, paths that are part of the esoteric symbolism contained in the traditions. These traditions, again, are Kabbalah, Tarot, and Freemasonry. And in uh, the third slide image that I've presented here, um, I'm showing major symbolism from these three different traditions that involves the three pillars or paths as they are known. In the Kabbalistic tradition, you have the tree of life as the major uh, occult symbol of that knowledge, of the knowledge that is communicated through Kabbalah. And it has three paths on it. The left-hand path, which is known as the path of severity, the right-hand path, which is known as the path of mercy, and the middle pillar, or the middle path, the middle way, which is known as the pillar of mildness. So you have the three pillars of Kabbalah, or the three paths of Kabbalah, and they form the tree of life. And the three buildings on 9-11, okay, correspond to these three paths or pillars in Kabbalah. So there's a symbolic corollary there. It's the same thing when it comes to the tarot tradition. You'll see many tarot cards with two pillars on both sides and then a character um, that represents an archetypal image in the middle of those pillars. This is mostly, uh, or best I should say, symbolized by the uh, second card of the major arcana, or uh, not second, but card number two of the major arcana. Of course, the fool card is the zero card. Card one is the magician, and card two is the high priestess. A card that represents the goddess, which we'll see this ritual was all about the destruction of that sacred feminine energy. And um, card the card I've depicted here in slide number three shows um, the pillars on either side of this goddess figure with the goddess in the middle representing the middle path or the middle way, which is the most direct path from base consciousness to higher consciousness, as we'll talk about. The uh, tradition of Freemasonry, as its first degree tracing board, of course, depicts these three pillars. In Freemasonry, um, it is they are known as the pillars of strength, beauty, and wisdom. And we'll break these down as we go through the different uh, um, images. So in image number four, I simply showed the Twin Towers and the um, Building 7 structure. In image number five, let's talk about how the Tree of Life is a correspondent symbolism to the, uh, the buildings that were attacked on 9-11, the Pentagon, the World Trade Center Towers, and World Trade Center Building number seven. I've laid out these buildings in a way that can help people to understand the symbolic corollaries. The two towers represent the two pillars, which are the thesis and antithesis columns, the pillar of severity and mercy, seeming diametric polar opposites, a male pillar and a feminine pillar. Okay, So the feminine pillar corresponds to the pi pillar of severity in the Kabbalah, uh, symbolized by the black um, sphere at the top representing understanding. Uh, severity is the sphere at the um, left-hand side in the middle, and mercy corresponds to the left-hand, um, I'm so uh, sorry, the right-hand pillar on the Kabbalistic tree, but it corresponds to the male 
building with the uh, radio antenna at the top. That would be the pillar of mercy in the um, 9-11 uh, building arrangement. Okay, The middle pillar is symbolized by building seven. Okay, or I should say building sem- seven symbolizes the middle pillar in this tradition. This is the all-important pillar. This is the pillar that leads from, as it is known in Kabbalah, Malkut, which is kingdom, which is base consciousness and physical world identification, to Keter, or the crown um, sephira, okay, which is um, higher consciousness, unity consciousness, it is the alignment of our thoughts, emotions, and actions toward the higher will of creation. So this is the highest expression of human consciousness in human form. And um, ultimately, it represents union with the spark of the divine that's within all of us. And that is symbolized in the ritual by the um, Pentagon, The Pentagon is the place where this entire ritual was orchestrated and conducted from, okay? So they view themselves, these these, um, sorcerers view themselves as God. They view themselves as the highest form of consciousness, and they're ultimately looking to destroy everything else. After all, the Pentagon survived. The other buildings were destroyed, okay? And destroyed by an act of their will, not because they collapsed due to... uh, you know, fires and and gravity, uh, they were actually taken down by them. And the middle pillar building, uh, building seven, is the key to the entire ritual, as we will see, because they ritualistically had to complete the destruction of building seven. My contention is because they actually did want to strike that building with another plane, and that plan was actually thwarted by an act of defiance against their orders. And I believe that the pilot um, who refused his stand down orders took the plane that was going to hit building seven, flight 93 out of the sky by an act of his will. And that threw a monkey wrench in this whole thing. And they had to then use their controlled demolition technique to simply take that building down when no plane had hit it. And that's one of the keys that has woken most people up to this event. Building seven is one of the main things that has woken many, many people up to the inside job aspect, at least of nine 11. So, um, the Kabbalistic tradition is one of the symbolic corollaries. And we have to understand that this tree symbol, the sephirotic tree of life, which is the main, symbol of Kabbalah is known as the ladder to God. So the buildings themselves representing the three paths on the Kabbalistic tree represent the ladder to higher consciousness, the ladder to higher spiritual awareness, which ultimately the magicians, the sorcerers of this event are symbolically destroying by physically destroying the three buildings in New York City. They are taking those down. Okay, and um, therefore they're separating man from higher awareness. They're separating human consciousness from being able to reunite with the higher self, with the divine presence. Uh, That's ultimately what this is symbolically saying. We look at the building numbers, which we'll do a little bit later in detail. One, two, and seven. The North Tower with the antenna was building one. The South Tower was building two and building seven. That totals ten, which is the exact number of spheres, the the emanations, the sephirot on the Kabbalistic tree of life. That's not an accident that there were ten there are ten sephirot on the tree of life, and yet there are the buildings totaling uh, one, two, and seven are ten, which are brought down. They're bringing down the tree of life symbolically. So that's a few aspects of the Kabbalistic tradition. We have to understand that ultimately all this is about is the destruction of consciousness. In the next image, I talk about the chakra system. See, if you bring the um, tree of life pillars together to form one pillar, if you take the 
the left-hand pillar and the right-hand pillar or paths and you collapse them inward, you collapse them into the center, you'll actually see that they form seven um, steps. They form seven pathways, okay? Um, that This is because three of the chakras of the body in the system of chakras that are talked about in the Vedic tradition are dualistic in nature. And four of them are unitary in nature. You have the base chakra, which is represented by the kingdom uh, Sephirah on the tree of life. Uh, I represent that in image number six by Saturn because this is ultimately a reflection of the macrocosm. The entire solar system is contained within us. Okay, the, and th these are all aspects of human consciousness, aspects of ourselves. That's ultimately what these traditions help us to understand and go deep within. And by the way, so people understand quantum physics, quantum mechanics, it's talking about exactly what Mark is talking about right now. And this all dovetails together how the, the planets align with the chakras, the the tree of life if you merge it together it's the same thing it's right. just evidence of what we've said thousands of times before that we are all part of the same energy and that we are ultimately responsible for projecting this outward and just right. so people are aware the nazis were working on this this was a lot of the secret weapons technology that the ss was working on they had a, an entire um cadre i guess you could say inside the ss itself that they were it was devoted to occult yep. teachings and mysticism and stuff like this and i mean i'm researching i i've, I've dived back into this because uh, this is just where the path is leading me right. and as i as i research their their work further mark it all lines up with exactly what you're talking of about course, now because so, it's all about energy and ultimately they were working toward directed energy weapons which as if you look deeper into 911 you'll recognize that's really what was broken out this was also the dawn of the new age of weaponry space based directed energy weapons this was a, a mass demonstration of that ultimately this was this country saying to all other countries look at what we're willing to do to our own people imagine what we're willing to do to you with this technology if you don't play ball with us that's really what they they were saying going back into the uh correlation between the tree of life and the uh the chakras you know you see then the different planets representing the other chakras or the other aspects or steps of the tree of life foundation being corresponding to jupiter which is the desire principle um you have splendor and victory uniting to form the planet mars which is the solar plexus chakra or will center of course the um beauty um uh sephira of the tree of life represents the earth and moon planetary system and that's the heart chakra of course the center of the tree of life the center of the self uh the the uh center of the aspect of of spiritual life within ourself the heart care okay which is what the lesson to learn here on earth is all about you know you bring together the severity and mercy uh sephirot and that forms the um uh, throat chakra symbolized by Venus in slide number six, and then you bring together the understanding and wisdom um, sephira and sephirot, and that uh, forms Mercury, the mercurial aspect. That's the third eye chakra, and of course the Keter chakra, another unitary chakra. That is the crown chakra. Um, the Keter uh, sephira is the crown chakra in the system of chakras. So. Uh, and it also means crown in the original Hebrew. It means, uh, Keter means crown. So that's, th those two slides together, five and six, are simply showing the correlation that the tree of life is indeed a representation of the self and the energy centers, the energy uh, upwellings that exist within uh, man. Th this, these are centers of glandular activity in man, but ultimately they're centers of spiritual upwelling energy within our body. Uh, because that's the energy that ultimately gives us life. So that's what they're about destroying. That's what this whole thing is about demolishing. It's not a demolition of buildings. It's a demolition of the human spirit. It's a demolition of the higher aspects of the self and the understanding of those aspects of the self. That's what they're ultimately destroying symbolically through the event. And 
let's move to the tarot tradition because there's very direct, obvious symbolism within tarot that uh, is correlated to the 9-11 event. Of course, you have the uh, thunderstruck tower, okay, the energy struck towers that is bringing the tower down, setting it on fire, having people thrown out of it. And this is exactly what happened on 9-11. This is slide number seven that I'm looking at now. And um, you can see the correlation, the Thunderstruck Tower card of the tarot tradition. I believe that is card number 16, if I'm not mistaken, and the of the Major Arcana. And the uh, energy struck, uh, initially plane struck, but then, of course, directed energy struck buildings in New York City. And people, the, the uh, flames lighting them up. Uh, from the uh, initial impacts and then people jumping from the buildings because of whatever kinds of energy was taking place in there, not just because of flames, but obviously other energies and other aspects of the mechanisms by which these towers were ultimately destroyed were taking place in the buildings. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that you know people in the buildings were jumping for other reasons than fire. You see a lot of images where people were standing in the building and there were not flames and smoke accosting them and, um, you know, suggesting that these hydrocarbon fires weren't burning as hot as many people claim that they were. So the reasons for people jumping was probably these, this form of directed energy. And, um, again, this is a direct symbolic correlation to the tower card in the tarot tradition. If we look at the main tarot card that represents the entire tradition, because this is the book of um, truth, this is the book of the goddess tradition, ultimately. Card number two is probably the biggest symbolic card when it comes to the tarot tradition, and that's what the destruction of these buildings, again, was all about. You'll see the Tree of Life actually depicted behind the uh, goddess figure in the uh, number two card, the high priestess in the major arcana of the tarot deck. She's holding a scroll that says Torah, which is law, because she represents the knowledge of natural law, uh, the understanding and application of that knowledge, which is wisdom. Okay, She is the goddess of wisdom, Um, She is uh, depicted here as the Isis figure. Uh, This would correlate to the Egyptian tradition. This is one of the ways that Isis was depicted. Of course, you can look at the goddess as any uh, goddess throughout the traditions of history that have depicted her and uh, described her attributes. This is Mary uh, of the Christian tradition. This is Semiramis of the Babylonian tradition. Uh, This is um, uh, Isis and Hathor, and Maat of the Egyptian tradition. Um, This is Aphrodite, and um, uh, Athena of the, uh, and Diana of the Greek and Roman traditions. So, it doesn't matter what name you're calling her, it represents the same thing. This is the understanding and application of natural law principles, of the universal spiritual laws that exist in the cosmos that we are bound by, and that we Uh, need to come into a a deep understanding of and apply ourselves to that understanding through care. This is the sacred feminine care tradition. This is the the heart-based knowledge that we really need to bring ourselves into alignment with. So it's natural law, it's care, it's higher consciousness, it's all of these things. That's what the goddess represents it's an aspect of ourselves. It's getting in communion with the higher aspect of, of ourselves. So she is, of course, the middle pillar. She's the middle way, the most direct route from base consciousness to higher level awareness. Uh, therefore, she's the middle pillar once again. Okay, And she's seated between the other two pillars, the pillars of uh, thesis and antithesis, the, the white and black pillars. A, the B representing Boaz and the J representing Joaquin. That's the pillars of the Temple of Solomon. Again, we'll see that again in the Freemasonic tradition. But it's 
it's as, uh, an extension of the Kabbalistic tradition, which is really the root tradition uh, that tarot and Freemasonry are ultimately derived from because it's all the same universal knowledge. Ultimately, all of these traditions are about the communication of natural law principles to people. So uh, what the destruction of these buildings is about is destroying the goddess principle. It's about destroying the sacred feminine energy. It's about destroying true care. It's about the, you know creating apathy. It's about you know uh, destroying the understanding of higher level law. It's about keeping people in fear through controlling their emotions, putting them into trauma through the, you know, attack on the sacred feminine emotional qualities of the being. And that's what the destruction of these buildings is ultimately about symbolically. And we see the symbolic correlation. We look at the name, right? This is said to be a um, um, attack on... Um, it's a, a terror attack, okay? Uh, 9-11 was done by terrorists. And when you hear some of the people uh, who were actually part of the orchestration of this event, like uh, George Bush Jr. and Rudolph Giuliani, say the word terror. They say it like the original name of the goddess, terror, you know, or uh, Tara. Tara is the goddess of the earth. The earth is called Terra. Okay? The original goddess name in the oldest goddess traditions is Tara. So this is an attack on the earth, ultimately. We have a war on Tara, a war on the earth, a war on Tara, a war on the goddess. And they're deliberately not saying terror. You know, it's it's a green language perspective they're they're saying it that way for a deliberate reason they know ultimately what this is about this is about destroying the people of the earth because ultimately if you really look deep enough into it this is not of the earth this is from directed from somewhere other than just the physical earthly domain it's a higher a dimensional directive that this is all ultimately being served up to. And you can believe in that or not believe in that. That's your personal decision or choice. But there are higher dimensional aspects to what went on on this day, as far as I'm concerned. And again, this is about feeding on that energy. Uh, the, the entities that ultimately these sick, twisted, psychopathic, dark occultists worship are they consider that they're not in this dimension, that they're in a higher dimension, and they're offering this up as food to them. So um, the war on terror is actually a war on Tara. And if we understand that that name came from the goddess tradition, which was all about service to truth, the goddess's name morphed um, in linguistic terms throughout time to ultimately come down to us as the English word truth. It, it was Tara, then Tarut, then Taruth, then truth. Because the goddess represents the knowledge of right and wrong. It's conscience, conscience, common knowledge. It is the knowledge of cosmic spiritual law, universal laws that are in place. That's what the goddess tradition was ultimately about conveying. And it does this through the tarot tradition. That's what the tarot is about, the communication of natural law, just like the Kabbalistic tradition is about. And as we will see, the Freemasonic tradition is also originally about that. All of these traditions, again, have uh, perverted aspects to them and uses that uh, the dark occultists are actually using in their favor. The original intent of these traditions, of course, is the uplift of consciousness, the uplift of man through the understanding of those higher laws. And again, that is the goddess tradition as well. Uh, and that's why they had to bring down Building 7. They couldn't leave that standing because it would be representative of the, the, uh, the dynamic of care still being present symbolically. 
That building represented the goddess principle, the principle of care and truth. That's why we have a 9-11 truth movement. We're trying to resurrect that sacred feminine energy of care to get people to care enough to bring the truth forward. And ultimately, that's what this ritual is about devastating, is about demolishing. It's br- they had to bring that building down to complete the ritual. It could not be allowed to remain standing because, again, that symbolically would have represented the goddess is still alive. Care is still alive. Truth is still alive. And they want to destroy all of those things. Okay? So let's look at some other tarot symbolism related to the event. The two towers themselves have sim- symbolic significance in the tarot tradition. Uh, you look at card number um, 15, which is the death card. It's the black rider on the white horse coming to mow down the king and the priest. Well, this is government unifying through their dialectic the old world order and the new world order. Okay, They're bringing in the new world order through the destruction of the old world order, which was kings and priests. But the new rider is government who's going to be the king of the world because people don't challenge or question authority. And he's he's death. Ultimately, that's death for humanity. It's enslavement and ultimately destruction. He's bringing in the inverted five-petaled rose, the inverted pentagram, the destruction of care the black flag represents. Okay, this is annihilation. He's already destroyed the... um, the king, and he's getting ready to destroy the priest. What this represents is he's already king. You know, he's already the secular ruler, but he wants to make himself into a religion, into the world religion, is what the rider death or the symbolic I- idea of government is trying to make himself into. It's not only a one world um, government, it's a one world religion that worships the government as their god. Okay, and money is ultimately their 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 god that directs this entire process. So he's bringing this banner for the real god. Government is actually doing the service of the real dark order, which he's carrying the banner for. And again, that's an inverted pentagram. So that's the symbol of Satanism. That's the symbol of Satan. Um, the the idea of perpetual conflict, perpetual opposition, perpetual strife and suffering. You don't have to look at it as a person. These are conceptual ideas that represent things going on in the physical world. You see behind him, behind the the horse, behind the priest, there is, or Pope, there is uh, two pillars in the background with the setting sun. And ultimately, that's what these pillars represent. These are the two pillars that are being destroyed to bring one thing into existence. Again, uh, thesis and antithesis have to be annihilated to create the artificial synthesis that uh, you want to bring in as your uh, ultimate agenda, as your end game. That's what the Hegelian dialectic is ultimately all about. And again, people should understand also when I refer to the Hegelian dialectic, it isn't that Hegel himself was evil or came up with this idea. He recognized this principle and simply wrote about it. And uh, it's a, it, a dark application of the, um, uh, of the uh, principle that he recognized and, and coined and put it into a philosophical, uh, a philosophical framework. It isn't that he invented this dialectic. It's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Um, you can see examples of it throughout history. He just basically kind of uh, uh, coalesced it and codified it in writing and then – People have, you know, ascribed the term to him, the Hegelian dialectic. But again, it's not as if he invented it. He's simply describing it. So to go back to the symbolism on uh, this card, this is about the dialectic being um, unified in the end. And the person who is doing that is the death principle representing total control of government and replacing the institutions of king and religion of, of uh, state and religion with one world government. That's the rider of death on the white horse carrying the banner for the ultimate expression of evil, uh, the, the destruction of care, which is, again, that inverted five-petaled rose on the black flag. So um, those um, pillars herald that time. 
this is this is a time card i would say it's telling you this is what's happening at the time that uh that new world order is being brought into reality is being birthed into form into manifestation is these pillars there the energy is 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 going between these pillars and it's it's ultimately setting it's bringing them down it's bringing the light down okay um a clear direct symbolic correlation to the 911 event uh for those who understand the symbology of this tarot card um Another tradition we it's need to It's literally look at. behold a pale horse. Exactly. Yes. Uh, bringing death. Bringing the rider death. And that is the new world order uh, as they, the dark occultists refer to it. I call it the dark new world order because we're in the stage of transition right now, which is a period of choice. That we have a choice whether we're going to let this dark world order be ushered in or not. We can create a true, positive, light new world order based on truth, justice, um, you know, uh, knowledge, care, uh, all the things that we really want to see come into fruition. Uh, the new world order is two things. It's not just one. Um, it, there's a positive uh, outcome and then there's this dark new world order, the negative outcome of enslavement and perpetual suffering and strife and a world that is turned into a hell. So uh, the prison planet, so to speak. So um, let's look at the Freemasonic tradition, which uh, is encapsulated by the first degree tracing board of the entered apprentice degree. This uh, would take so long to break down in its entirety uh, that we don't have time for that. So let's just look at the pillar aspect of it. The pillars represent the ability to climb to a higher level of awareness in this card the checkerboard floor of the house represents base consciousness or unconsciousness not knowing ignorance not knowing the difference between right and wrong not understanding natural law and the pillars represent the way that we have to unify our emotions represented by the uh pillar on the right the lunar pillar the pillar of boaz and the pillar on the left the solar pillar or the pillar of strength. These are the emotional and action qualities with, of the individual. Our emotions and our actions need to come together and align with our knowledge. So as we think, which is that's the middle pillar, the pillar of wisdom, having knowledge of you know, how the laws of nature work, so we feel, which is the, the B pillar, and so we act, the S pillar. Okay, they're being brought together so that they're all one. Thoughts, emotion, emotion, and action aligning into oneness. And by the way, this dovetails into what Mark and I were talking about on Friday with the Matrix uh, movies decoded, where Trinity, Morpheus, and Neo were thought, emotion, and action. Same thing. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything is ultimately trying to tell us the same thing about what's really going on here on earth and within ourselves. It's all an inward manifestation. Uh, it's an inward manifestation and then we're projecting that outwardly and creating that external manifestation of the things that we have to experience in the physical reality to teach us the lessons that we need to learn. And the Masonic tradition is ultimately in its true original esoteric intent about the communication of natural law and about true morality and bringing our actions into alignment with that higher level understanding. And uh, again, I would not make the claim that that's what the modern lodge system of Freemasonry is about. Um, this is an ancient tradition that has been ultimately degraded through time. And perverted so, for their own uses. That's correct. But that doesn't mean there's no original tradition that is worth deeply studying and coming to a deep understanding of because of how it will uplift your knowledge and how it will uplift your way of being in the world to bring that uh, modality of action into harmony with nature's laws. You know, so, I noticed on yes. that card that there's the four directions 
north, uh, east, That's south, correct. and west. Yes. But they're not like you would think. Normally, you would think that they would depict north at the very top, right. but it's not. It's actually depicted on the left hand this side. This is because ultimately, this tradition is all about the light, which is coming into knowledge of truth, and that is associated with the sun, which is in the eastern direction. The sun rises in the east. All of the um, uh, symbols at the top, the sun, the all-seeing eye, and the moon, ultimately represent the sun, which is the light, which is knowledge. It's the light of the creator, okay? And whether we have that developed or not, uh, this is it really depicted – if you turn the tracing board on its side – to the right. If you turn it 90 degrees to the right, I br- I've broken this down on my podcast at whatonearthishappening.com. You go to the podcast section, uh, look into the sections on Freemasonry, and I have shown an image of this turned to the side. Um, basically, it the, the floor of the house represents Earth. Okay, the checkerboard floor is the meridian and latitude lines, the, the uh, latitude and longitudinal lines of the Earth. And um, the three pillars represent the path of the sun between the um, uh, tropics of Cancer Capri- and Capricorn with the middle pillar representing the equator. And the lowest point of the sun at the winter solstice at the Tropic of Capricorn is the, the moon, okay, when you turn it on its side. And that represents not being in knowledge or being earthly identified as the base of the ladder, And then as you go up the ladder, you cross the point of balance, the equator, gathering more light because now the sun and uh, the day and night periods are equal, okay? And then you go past that. That's the point that you start caring, ultimately, care, which is that middle figure, that green figure in the middle represents care or the goddess again, the middle pillar. See, she's the feminine initiate on the pillar dressed in green, the color of the heart chakra. And that the key there represents the care is the key to everything. It unlocks the stargate that leads off the earth, out of earthbound identification and ultimately off the prison planet. You can't get off that uh, that, uh, floor of the house without getting that key. And the key is symbolically depicted dangling by a thread because care is dangling by a thread in our world. We have to take it into our hand. You know, if we want to unlock the stargate, which the ladder leads to, which is about cosmic illumination, illumination into the light of truth, true knowledge, true wisdom. So, Hence why they call themselves the Illuminati, which means the enlightened ones. Right. Well, yeah, they're not really the Illuminati, the enlightened ones. There are true il- illuminated ones on this planet, you know, and – uh I say that's the people who really understand what's going on here, know the truth, and know the way out of this uh, prison uh, society that we're working ourselves into. They're the real Illuminati, you know, not these psychopathic, twisted, so-called elite. They're, I, I've said they're not the elite of anything. Yeah, no, they're they're, they're, they're just they're a bunch of control of freaks, right? And yeah, you're the, you are you are correct when you say that. At least, in, you know, I, I know you are, but it, especially in my estimation, you are correct when you say that there are people out there that know the truth unfortunately the psychopaths in power uh, outnumber those people uh, and it's up to us to fill the rest of the ranks with the illuminated waking people up and turning this around and ultimately getting off of this prison planet that's right so this tradition is all about um consciousness it's all about building a better individual uh, that is in alignment with truth, is in alignment with the laws of the cosmos. And um, this picture represents the Temple of Solomon symbolically. And that's the human brain and heart, the system of the mind and the heart coming together as one. See, the sun, soul, and moon, moon, Solomon, the sun and moon coming together uniting the masculine aspects and the feminine aspects, or in other words, action and emotion, being united to climb the ladder representing the middle pillar, the pillar of wisdom. That's what wisdom is when you unite those two seemingly opposite principles, bringing together the thesis and antithesis. The thesis is action. The antithesis is emotion. You're bringing them together 
to, to really form true wisdom, which is the unification of the two, bringing your actions into alignment with what you know to be true and what you feel to be true, and then you're doing those things. That's what real, that's what the real synthesis is all about. Would and you say that the, the story of King Solomon is, is an allegory? Absolutely. It is absolutely an allegory. People who think that uh, this is all about a physical structure don't, do not understand the allegory whatsoever. You know, and the, the, the Ark of the Covenant being housed, the, 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 the essence of God being housed in the Temple of Solomon. It's about the divine spark that exists within all of us being housed within our mind and heart. And if it really needs to reside there, if it's really going to reside there, we need to unify those things. We need to bring our actions into accord with what we know and feel to be right. It's all a, a symbolic allegory. The people who take it literally have no understanding what is trying to be communicated in those books of the Bible. Would you say the grail is the, uh, the representative of the sacred feminine? Absolutely. Like the Absolutely. womb? The chalice is the sacred feminine womb that actually holds the blood of the sun. Okay, this is the energy of the light, the, the knowledge that is that we have to take into ourselves in an act of communion with that truth in order to uh, be reborn, to, to come out of our deadened state of awareness, the lack of consciousness, and that's represent, that, that uh, lack of consciousness is represented by this checkerboard floor in the uh, sim symbolic tradition of Freemasonry, and getting off of that is, you know, ascending to the realm of the quote-unquote gods, to a higher level of awareness cosmically, represented by the sun, moon, and all-seeing eye. You know, um, that's what these traditions are all about. They're about understanding aspects of the self and applying those in a way that aligns our actions with cosmic universal law and therefore we're consciously co-creating our existence as opposed to being a victim of what we're doing because we don't understand the laws of causality that are always in operation anyway and that we're just ignoring right now so um the this tradition is also uh represented by a figure Hiram Abiff that is the master builder and he represents truth and he is depicted in the next image sitting between the two pillars, okay? He is the middle pillar as well, and he represents truth and he represents care, the care dynamic that ultimately gets us to the truth, just as the middle pillar initiate on the image before represents the care dynamic. So ultimately, this entire ritual is about the destruction of that middle pillar, the pathway from base consciousness to higher consciousness. See, the, the, the ladder in the first degree tracing board is hinged on that middle pillar. It rests up against it. It is the ladder. It's called Jacob's Ladder, actually, in the tradition, which is a correlation to the biblical story of Jacob's Ladder. And that's another reason they couldn't leave it standing. They cannot leave the ladder to God, to higher consciousness, standing. It had to be destroyed. The fact that it stayed and they, they really wanted Flight 93 to hit it and yet that didn't happen is a, is, a, is a symbolic nod to us that ultimately care still does stand. Truth still does stand. They could bring it down in an act of controlled demolition, but that doesn't mean they really truly in, in reality brought down the concept of care the real dynamic of care going on in the world and they, to, to actually show a, like a, a layman's example of that in case somebody doesn't get what mark is saying is building seven wasn't hit by flight 93 so they were forced to still pull it at the end of the day right and drop it into right. a, a pile and what is the one thing one of the most powerful smoking guns if you will of the 9-11 truth movement Building Seven's right. collapse. So you see how it dovetails together? There still is a chance, and that's why the truth is getting out there, because care has not totally been eradicated. There are still good people out there that love everyone else and are willing to do what they have to do to wake people up. To the truth, and they're not going to let that truth die, and we're not going to let uh, the people who uh, perished in this event, their memories die because uh, you know people still believe the falsities of this event. The 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 real reason. 
that these psychopaths murdered these people is going to be brought to light, to the light of day. And we're going to get that understanding out into the public and have it be grasped by the people who uh, lost those family members so that their memory can really be honored. Because right now, as it stands, the people who are really responsible for this, the mass murderers, a 3,000-person mass murder, the people who are responsible are, are walking free in the world. That's the real reality of, of what we're, we've seen and allowed to happen in our midst. And that has to be changed. We cannot let that stand. So a um, couple of other quick aspects, a biblical correlation uh, in biblical symbolism to this event is the Babylonian gold-headed man of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Uh, this is in the book of Daniel, which is a prophetic book that talks about um, the rulership of the world, basically. It talks about um, this king of Babylon and his dream about the unification of all of the world, okay? A, a new world order, so to speak. And the dream depicts this gold-headed man that is depiction of rulership. And again, you could look at this in the positive sense or the negative sense. It could be about self-rulership, about bridging the things that keep us internally divided and coming to unity consciousness, which is alchemical gold. You could look at it in the negative sense of that it's all about the psychopathic ruling elite that consider themselves the head Okay, that want to unify the whole world under their rule. And in that in that that sense, that's what the two pillars represent. The two pillars represent the pillars of church and state that they need to destroy completely. That's the separation aspect in um you know modern forms of government that um ostensibly keep those two things uh separate, and they're represented by the iron legs and then finally by the clay feet of the gold-headed man. The torso is bronze, that uh, thighs and torso, that represents, you know, the uh, empires of old um, that were even more authoritarian than what we have now. And then finally going up to silver, which takes us back into the ancient world where there were, um, you know, uh, even more unified empires that like the, uh, the Roman empire, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Egyptian and Babylonian empires, uh, Persian Empire, I should say, that really had a more tight authoritarian grip and was even more unified in that regard. But then when you get up to the, the very top, the gold-headed man, you're talking about 100% uh, total control, pharaonic dynasty of there is no separation between the ruler and, and God, that he is speaking the divine law of God in man's form. And to question him is to question God itself. You know, it's a king, priest, God representative on earth, and that's it. And his word is law. That's ultimately the kind of dictatorship they want to get back to, you know, where this cabal is that gold head directing the rest of the body, which is the people of earth, and they do its bidding unquestioningly, just like, you know, we think and direct the body and uh, it does our bidding at, at the whim of the brain, of the head. So ultimately, that's another aspect that these pillars being destroyed represent. They don't want it separated. They don't want the um, church-state aspect. They don't want uh, division in rule. They want unity in rule. They want a one-world government that is both state and church, that is both state and religion. And this is symbolized by what they're building in place of the two towers. Where two towers stood, they're building one tower. The Freedom Tower, depicted uh, a, a early rendering here, depicted in slide number 13. This tower is almost completed now. And I believe it's scheduled for completion in the year 2013. So um, these two towers, the thesis and antithesis, are being bridged. They're being brought together as one tower, and it's being called in Orwellian terms the Freedom Tower. Uh, incidentally, 1,776 feet tall. They love their numerology, which we're going to get to and understand why 1,776 feet tall, because that is equivalent to 777, uh, a number representing completion. But this tower is going to represent nothing of the sort. 
It's not going to represent you know, higher consciousness. It's not going to represent true freedom. Again, it's a symbolic element, a symbolic corollary to the dark Hegelian dialectic, the bridging of uh, different aspects of control, namely government and religion, bringing them together as one. So let's look at the numerological aspects finally here. Slide number 14 shows, again, the um, symbolic corollary to the Kabbalistic tradition in numbers. Ten sephirot on the tree of life plus the hidden sphere known as Da'at, which is not considered one of the ten sephirot, but the, the place where the tree grows from, the place of hidden knowledge from which this is all derived and ultimately leading back to. Uh, it's the place of the soul and the macrocosm, the cosmos, the universe. There are ten actual emanations on the tree representing ten different aspects of the self. And again, we see building one, two, and seven there in the middle, corresponding to the paths of the tree of life, and also the numbers of the buildings totaling to the amount of emanations on the tree itself, ten. And this is an, another reason. They're, they're ultimately bringing down the male and female, the one and the zero, emotions and actions. They don't, and ultimately, of course, the middle pillar, okay? True care and knowledge. They're, they're destroying all of that through this event. And 10 is a symbolic number. It ultimately reduces in gematria, which is ultimately what we're talking about here, which is a form of occult numerology, it reduces to one. Okay? So oneness is being attacked, is being destroyed. Unity. Again, the unit unifying of the masculine and feminine principles. So keeping people in duality and opposition is what the destruction of that is about through the destruction of the ten uh the number 10 symbolically uh, corresponding to the 10 sephirot or emanations on the Kabbalistic tree. To understand the symbolism of the numbers, of the numbers involved in 9-11, we have to look at two basic numbers in occult terms, and that is the triple digit 777 and the triple digit 666. Many people are somewhat familiar with with the symbolic meanings of these numbers, especially 666. But to break it down, this is in uh, the chart on slide number 15 now. We're talking about occult numerology or gematria, the, the coming together of number and form. That's what gematria really is. And we're, we're bridging the idea of numbers with symbolic uh, concepts of representative concepts so the number 777 in occult teachings usually means man in a state of unity consciousness. Each one of the numbers corresponds to an aspect of consciousness. The first seven representing our thought, the quality of our thought. The second seven representing the quality of our emotion. And the third seven representing the quality of our actions. Thought, emotion, and action, each being given one of these digits. Seven representing the number of being like the divine in physical form. So it's not becoming God. It's embodying the qualities of the divine in human form. So it's being, as the words of Christ in the New Testament attest to, it's being like, uh, it's being in the world, but not of it. Okay, Having reached a higher level of consciousness, you're not identified with the ego and with simple five sense terms, five sense perception, you understand there's a higher quality to the self, a higher essence, a higher self, and you're in touch with that fully. And therefore you are in the world, but not of it. You're still doing the work that you need to be doing here, but you're not five sense identified. You're not trapped in what is known as ego identification anymore. You have freed the mind. You have freed the spirit and you understand you're still in a physical prison here because of how everyone else is still in the cage of mind and spirit and you're working on the ground in the physical world to try to do the work to help others to come to that same awakening and realization and free their own minds. 
so that they can embody that divine essence that is within all of us in the in the world and that's bringing the light of the creator into the world for full expression so that's 777 that's what that represents thought emotion and action are activated unified and complete it is uh you know a, a christed being it is a a being that uh, has come into the same level of consciousness that is described by uh, Jesus in the New Testament. And when we do the ge- gematria reduction of the number 777, what we're doing is we're adding the individual digits up to come to a, a number. So you add 7 plus 7 plus 7. Well, that's 21. Okay, 7 plus 7 is 14, plus 7 is 21. Then you take that number and you reduce it further. You're getting down to a three-digit number, a one-digit number. So you, you started with three digits, now you have a two-digit number. Well, we're going to reduce that. 21 is 2 plus 1. That's 3. You can't reduce it anymore. So the reduction in gematria terms of 777 is 3. 666 is the opposite of 777. Okay? It is man in base consciousness, the lack of awareness ego identification, five cents worldly identification, survival mode only, fight flight mode only, ignorance, apathy, laziness, cowardice, all of the things that create self-inflicted suffering in our lives. So thought, emotion, and action are dead. They're inactive. They're incomplete. You haven't worked on those things. So you're in base consciousness or beast consciousness. That's why this is the number of the beast. And in the Bible, in Revelation, where this number is is uh, spoken of, it doesn't say that it's the number of a man. That is the, a mistranslation. It, it says that it is the number of man, not of a man. It's the term for mankind, not just a single individual. It is the number of mankind because most of mankind is trapped in that dynamic. Most of mankind has not worked on their thoughts, emotion, and actions enough to bring them to a level of unity consciousness. And therefore, they're in the state of beast mind, of beast spirit. They're they're not in connection with spirit. They don't have a spiritual connection to higher self. They're in beast consciousness. So this is saying in that book that humanity as a whole is the beast. We're, we're, we're building for that beast um, higher aspect, you know, which is this higher aspect dimension of these entities or um, chaotic energies. We're, we're doing their work in the level of consciousness that we're at. We're ultimately, as a people, as a species, not doing the work of the true creator. We're not in harmony with nature's laws. We're not in harmony with higher law, with higher level awareness. If we were, we would be the 777. That would be our number. Our number is 666. And we need to make it our goal, our work, to transform ourselves into the 777 to change consciousness such that we can bring our actions into alignment with our thoughts and our emotions and become the, that embodiment of divine intelligence in the physical domain and become the 777. So that's the goal. That's the whole purpose of being here, of, of, of life on earth, ultimately is to change that level of consciousness and work with the aspects of ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions to bring them to a level of activation and completion and unification and become the 777. So when we do the reduction of this number, 666, we see 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 18, and then 1 plus 8 is 9. So 9 is the number of base consciousness or the beast or ego, and it's our goal to transmute it into the 777 or the 3. So to go from 9 to 3, 93 is considered the number of ascension from base consciousness to unity consciousness. So we're going to see why 9 is also considered the number of the beast or the number of Satan. It is ego or base consciousness. When we add 9 in slide number 16, 
it shows a chart of the additive properties of number the number nine on the left and the multiplicative properties on the right. When we add nine to any number, we see that it changes nothing. The ultimate value stays the same. It's as if you're adding a zero. So nine plus one is ten. Then you re- do the gematria reduction on ten. One plus zero, it's one. Well, we started with one and added nine, and we ended up back at one. It was like adding nothing. It was like adding a zero in the additive property. Two plus nine, we started at two, we add a nine. That's 11. One plus one is two. We're back to two. Three plus nine, we started at three, we add a nine, we get 12. One plus two, three. We're back to three. You could do this for any number. And you will always go back to the same number when you add a 9 after you reduce. It's like adding a 0. So the, the concept is you're, you're taking the numerological concept and now applying it to a concept about consciousness. Adding 9, which is representative of the beast of base consciousness or ego identification, changes nothing. Adding ego to a situation changes nothing. You cannot change anything if you're at that level of consciousness. Let's look at the multiplicative properties of nine. Nine times any number will give you a result that if you add those digits together, it will always equal nine. Nine times two is 18. One plus eight is nine. Nine times three is 27. Two plus seven is nine. 9 times 4 is 36. 3 plus 6 is 9. Any number that you add, that you multiply 9 by, the result, if you add the digits together and reduce, continue to reduce that way, will give you 9. It doesn't even matter if you do it with decimal values. You will always get 9. So 9 is the number of ego replication. When more ego, when ego multiplies, you get more ego. Only more ego can ever be made when you multiply. See, conceptually, in consciousness, we're taking a, a number property and we're applying a conceptual idea about consciousness to it. And then you can understand why it's Satan's number, why it's the beast's number, it's the beast consciousness. It's being trapped in the level of oppositional consciousness, which is represented by Satan. The word Satan means the opposer, the adversary, adversarial, oppositional consciousness, trapped in ego, warring with everything else around you. When you multiply that, what else do you get in the world but more of it? Okay, so these are the properties of nine. That's why nine is the number of illusion and base consciousness. And even in Satanism, you read the book, the Satanic Bible and the Satanic Rituals, uh, LaVey, who started the, the outward religion of Satanism, would um, uh, agree nine is the number of Satan. He says it openly. I actually have a slide on that on my website uh, in this uh, section. So you look at the properties of nine and understand that only the three is real. Only the 777 is real. The 666 is an illusion. Since it equals nine, you add it, and it doesn't change anything. It doesn't equal anything. It only keeps you where you're at, okay? So that illusion needs to be shed. That's what the number 93 represents, shedding all of the illusions and coming up to a higher level of knowledge and awareness. It's an ascension process. So the actual number 911, okay, we add the two ones together, we get 92. Then you you could add that together, you get back to 11, which is two. So it's still duality. There's no oneness there. There's certainly no threeness in the sense that three is the unification of our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. It's, you know, three separate ones for each aspect of consciousness. That's why 111 in Gematria is equivalent to 777. They both add to three. So three ones or three uh, is seven, seven, seven is the completion of man's thought, emotion, and action in the physical domain. The falling short of that number, 93, which represents ascension, willpower, love, care, truth, ascension to higher consciousness. The failure of that is 92. You didn't make it to 93. You didn't get there. You fell short. 
You didn't climb the ladder. You didn't go all the way. Okay, that falling short, that fall and remaining in base consciousness is symbolized occultically by the number 92. So that's what the entire ritual is about. That's why it was named 911 because it's the number 92 in disguise. That's why the police's number is 911. Calling them is failure to r- arise to a higher level of consciousness. You're stuck in conflict. You're stuck in opposition. You're stuck in base consciousness and awareness. You're stuck in lack of care. You're stuck in dominator thought patterns and calling on dominators to help you with your problems. So 93 represents coming out of that state. And ultimately, this ritual represents remaining in that state of base consciousness. It's 92 out of the true number, 93, the number of ascension and will. You do the reduction, you get, ultimately, you get two-thirds. 92 out of 93, you just, the nines are zeros. We're not talking about division here. We're talking about occult numerology. You do the reduction like you do in gematria. 9 plus 2 is 11. 1 plus 1 is 2. 9 plus 3 is 12. 1 plus 2 is 3. So it ultimately represents 2 out of 3. And now if we do math reduction, actual reduction, uh, uh, division, we get a repeating 6. And again, that number is the falling short number. It is remaining in an incomplete and low consciousness modality. And the repetition of that eternally, forever, two-thirds is point six 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 and forever, repeating six. This conceptually, in the occult um, numerological terms, conceptually represents perpetual failure, eternal failure, never being able to raise your consciousness, never being able to come out of the illusion always staying in ego, always staying in base consciousness or beast consciousness. So that's the definition of hell. Eternal failure to get out of the ego-bound state that most people stay in all the time. And that's what this ritual is about. It's about it's a hell gate ritual. It's about cl- shutting down the ladder to to God, to unification consciousness and keeping people in an eternal state of Fear, separation, and perpetual failure when it comes to raising their awareness. And by anybody's definition, that's called hell. That's the definition of hell, is perpetually remaining in a prison, in under control, not aware, constantly suffering forever. And that's what this ritual is about. This ritual is about... Keeping people at that level of consciousness such that they are suffering eternally. And I don't think that's an understatement to say ultimately that's what this ritual is there is designed to orchestrate. So when we look at the number 93, again, it comes from the, 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 the Greek term thalema. This means – I'm on slide number um, 18 now. Thalema means will. It means love. Uh, it's uh, the the gem- gematria reduction of the Greek word thalema, which means will, reduces to 93. The word agape in Greek, which means love, reduces to 93. That means they're the same thing. To employ love is to employ will. To employ will is to employ love. They're the same thing. To use your will is to show love, is to show true care. To change the world for the better, toward the higher will, the will of creation. 93 represents this unity consciousness. It represents ascension out of ego and ascension out of duality consciousness. Again, it reduces to 3, so it is equivalent to 777. 93 reduces to 12, which 1 plus 2 is 3. So it's the same as 777. 93 and 777 are equivalents. The number 77, and that's one of the flight numbers. We're looking at all the flight numbers now. I should have said this at the beginning. Chart number, uh, slide number 18 has the chart of all of the flight numbers of the planes that hit the structures, okay? Or allegedly the planes that hit the structures. Because that, in the case of the Pentagon, 
is not the case. But not to you know get tangled up in that whole dynamic. We're simply looking at the numbers that were ascribed to the so-called planes. Okay, and again, as far as being actual physical planes go, they could have been um, missiles disguised to look by pl- like planes, and many other different elements are involved in that physical dynamic to really get to the truth about what we were really seeing on that day. So the whole point is I'm not trying to get uh, tied up in that, the five cents aspects of this. I'm trying to explain why these numbers are even chosen for these flights because this is a clear orchestration. Uh, I believe this is deliberate, okay? 93 is the number of will and it was set to hit the middle pillar, flight 93, the pillar of will, okay? Flight 77 struck the Pentagon, which is the sorcerer's domain where the event was directed out of. And this is the number of sorcery. 77 is the number of sorcery in the occult. 77 is also two of the three sevens when it comes to looking at it in comparison with the number 777 in occult terms. So it's 14 out of the 21, or two-thirds, when we do the reduction. If we do the division, 14 out of 21 is two-thirds. Two sevens out of three sevens. And again, there's that repeating six number again. Because 77 simply represents two out of the three aspects of consciousness unified. With the middle pillar missing. Thought, emotion, action. The middle is zero. 77 is actually 707. And the zero is removed because that middle pillar is gone. It's just thought and will, thought and action combined. So intellect combined with egoic will, but devoid of compassion. The heart, the feminine, the care isn't there. The emotions gone. A psychopath. The number of 77 represents psychopathy. Duality times seven, the two sevens. So that number of completion in the physical world representing duality. Duality completed because care is gone. It's one short of 78, symbolically representing the number of tarot cards. 77 means you're short of the truth. You're short of the goddess you know, and it, it, it's just perfectly, and that's, you know, this all fits in exactly perfectly. 78 tarot cards, the book of truth, the book of the goddess representing true care, 77 being the falling short of that. 93, the number of ascension, will, love, higher consciousness. 92 or 911, falling short of that. The number 11, a signaling number often used to identify occultists to each other specifically dark occultists or occultists who are working with chaotic energies. This is the number of chaos magic, 11. Duality represents the quote-unquote great work, the false uh, great work in their terms of synthesis between opposing forces. You know, Um, It's the perpetuation of chaos. It represents the fall into base consciousness. It's us versus them consciousness perpetuated. And I would say since then, we have fallen into base consciousness. I mean, look at how far we've gone down the crapper, uh, you know, if you want to put it in layman's terms, in 10 years, almost 11 now, since 9-11. I mean, look at it. The world is drastically different. How many times do people say, wow, this isn't the world I grew up in, this isn't the country I grew up in, you know, what's going on? Well, you now you, you know, People, uh, I would hope, have somewhat of a better understanding of the the behind-the-scenes forces that is driving this. Right. The last plane number, 175. We reduce that. That reduces to 13. 1 plus 7 is 8, plus 5 is 13. This is equivalent to the number 418, 418 in um, occult traditions, specifically the Thalamic tradition, which represents the word of manifestation, Abrahadabra. It is the number that means <clears throat> manifesting desires, but often from an from a, um, uh, egoic perspective. Okay, This ritual is called 
the, the, the real occult word or name for this ritual is the rite of manifestation. That's what the 9-11 ritual is. is. If you study the rite of manifestation in dark occultism, you, you understand that's what they were using. That's what this is a mass um, version of, a mass consciousness version of a, a ritual known as the rite of manifestation. Okay, And 175 is the flight that alerted everybody that this was a, quote, terror event, false flag terror event, yes, but that's the number that hit the South Tower, the flight number. So this is when the, the actual terror got infused into people, was injected by Flight 175. That's when everybody knew this wasn't an accident, that it was a deliberate event. And the number 175 is equivalent to 418 because 4 plus 1 is 5 plus 8 is 13. 418 also reduces to 13. So 175 and 418 are also identical. I think one of the reasons they used 175 instead of 418 is because to use the number 418 would have been so blatant as if all of these numbers together, 93, 77, 11, and 175 aren't blatant enough. If they just used the word, the number 418, it would have been so overwhelmingly obvious that this was directed by dark occultists that many more people would have just seen it so obviously because anybody that has even read any Thalamic tradition understands what the number 418 represents. So they they disguised it as 175. But in general, what this word is representative of is a magical working or a mass ritual, a ritual. That's what the number 418 represents it's it's doing the working you know as ritual work ritual magic dynamics and that's what this event is all about so the signaling number was used first which is 11 that's saying get ready that was flight 11 the second number is the number of manifestation or the number of ritualization which is 175 they call it the magic word Okay, the third plane was flight 77, the number of sorcery and opposition. And of course, the number 93 represents will. They're talking about their will when it comes to them using that that number, that flight number to represent their will to make this working happen and manifest their desires. Again, there's positive aspects to that number, of course, but they were using it in a sense of you of meaning let, let our will be done, not the higher will. So if we look at the numbers and put them on a chart, as I've done here in, in slide number 19, and put them on the buildings that they struck or allegedly struck, okay? <clears throat> the North Tower was struck by Flight 11. The South Tower by Flight 175. The Pentagon by Flight 77. And the, the middle pillar of this dynamic, Building 7, by Flight 93. And again, looking at this chart in slide number 19 helps with this. I'm just going to do the reduction of these numbers. Okay? So you'll see a null important figure emerge, which is 14. We reduce the 77 and we get 14. Because ultimately that's all they want to remain is the 77, the sorcerers. They're destroying everybody else. They're saying it's us versus everything else, and we're destroying everything else. And we're going to remain as God here, as kings here, and ultimately we're going to destroy the essence, the spiritual essence of everyone else, even if they remain in the physical world to serve us. Okay? That's their ultimate goal, their ultimate end game. Well, let's reduce 77. We get 14. We reduce that, and it becomes a 5. 11... I, I've simply, for the purposes of the chart, left it in the second uh, row as 11 uh, because of the way the chart is laid out here. But we reduce 11 and it becomes 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. 93, we reduce to 12. 9 plus 3 is 12. And then that reduces to 3. 175 reduces to 13. 1 plus 7 plus 5 is 13. And then it reduces to 4. So we already have a pattern here. We're, I mean, the chances of 77 
11, 93, and 175 were actually, if we look at um, the order, uh, ascending order of the buildings, then the Pentagon, it would be 11, 93, 175, and then the Pentagon is 77. That's 2, 3, 4, and 5, a direct progression. When we add 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 4 is 9, plus 5, we're back to 14. So 14 is a number that keeps coming up over and over again. And it's because that is the sorcerer's number. Again, I I call this an, an event of chaos sorcery. And that's who's ultimately directing it. So the entire number is about them, that this whole ritual is about. All of the the, the number 14 ultimately represents man as God. 77, the sorcerer, represents man as God. Not man embodying the qualities of the divine, but being God on earth. Being everywhere, being all-powerful, being you know, all-knowing, and ruling over everybody beneath him. And that's ultimately what these psychopaths want to be. They want to be God. They want to be God here. They want to rule in hell rather than serve in heaven. They want to rule the prison planet. So they are the 14. And th- that comes from the, the reverse of the great seal, the concept of being the all-seeing eye, being God incarnate in the physical domain. So there's 13 steps of that pyramid, and then there's the all-seeing eye on top of it, which represents the divine. That's the 14th level, which no man should be that. It's not about being God and controlling everything. It's, be, it's being in the space between getting past the bricks, getting past all the blocks to consciousness, and being in that space, and you are under the divine. You finally understand universal law, and you're living in the world, but not of it. So you're out into space. You're off the earth. Well, isn't you're, isn't the because I know some people have said that the the eye represents Lucifer, but isn't Lucifer Nimrod all? Isn't that all? I mean, and I've I shouldn't say I've I've heard some people. I should rephrase that. I I know that the eye represents Lucifer, but it, it's also deeper than that because Lucifer and Nimrod and all of this, it, it's all, it all goes back to the same thing. It, it, it's all this higher consciousness is right. what they're talking about. And Lucifer simply represents the light, the truth. Yeah, the light bearer is literally right. what it That's means, it. right? Lux ferre from Latin. That's where the term Lucifer is derived from. Lux in Latin means light, and ferre means to bring or to carry, to ferry something. Okay? F-E-R-E, ferry. Ferro ferre. It, it is to carry or to bring. So to carry the light, to bring the light, the creator is bringing the light to us, bringing the truth to us. You know, that's all it represents. That Those are the first words spoken in the Bible by God in Genesis is Lucifer. Let there be light. That's it. Fiat looks. Doesn't it say in the Bible also, I am the truth, I am the light? Exactly. Because it says the way to the Father is through the Son, which is the light, the Son, literally the Son, the light in the, in the heavens, representing knowledge, truth, goodness, oneness, right action. All of that is qualities that are associated with the Son, the light, taking the light into oneself. It, it, the dark aspect of Lucifer is when you have knowledge and you use it in a perverted sense to control other people which that's, th- that's their version or variant of Lucifer that they quote-unquote worship and embody because they're sorcerers. A sorcerer is one with knowledge that then uses that knowledge to control for his own agenda, his own purposes, his own egoic will, and doesn't care what the will of creation is. So again, yeah, that all-seeing eye represents the sorcerers as well. It's, there, it's a dual meaning. It's dual aspects. It depends on which building project are you talking about the new world order being the building of the world of enslavement, the dark new world order, in which case the eye represents the sorcerer wanting to be God, his embodiment of Lucifer, the dark aspect of Lucifer, or is the building project referred to in the great reverse of the great seal? Does that represent the positive new world order of freedom and ascension to higher consciousness? Well, that's the building project that the, the, 
true God of creation favors. You know, that's what it says. Uh, Anuit coeptus, he favors our work. Novus ordo seclorum, the new world order. Well, which one is it? And which God favors which work? The positive God of creation, the true God of creation, favors the, the work of bringing down that pyramidal structure and letting the light of the divine flood the earth, come down to the earth and join with man so that we're all enlightened. We have the light. The creator's light has been brought to us through the dynamic of wisdom and harmony with natural law. Conversely, the dark new world order is favored by the dark God, Satan, the dark aspect of Lucifer, and it's man ruling as God on, on a prison planet, a male dominator structure. But this number 14 represents that all-seeing eye, and it's associated with the Pentagon, the all-seeing eye, the orchestrative uh, network of intelligence agencies that's working from that location. The whole ritual all of the force that did the destruction, 11 plus 77 plus 93 plus 175, at least the ostensible forces that did the, the destruction, we know it's something much beyond simple planes, reduces to 14. You add all of those numbers up together, you'll get 14. 9-11 itself adds to 14. 9-11-2001 adds to 14. 9 plus 1 is 10, plus 1 is 11, right? Plus 2 out of 2001 is 13, and then 1, 14. The whole date, 9-11-2001, reduces to 14 in Gematria. So this number comes up over and over and over and over again, and there's a reason, because it ultimately represents sorcery. It represents the 77, or in other words, intellect and action together, which is what the sorcerers use, but care being annihilated care being cremated, being demolished, being destroyed forever. That's what psychopaths are. Those with intellect and the will to act, but with absolutely no care, no emotion. The sacred feminine, the goddess, is destroyed within them. And that's what they want for the whole world. So when we put these final, these flight numbers on the, on the buildings in the arrangement that I have here in slide 21, we see it even more obvious aspect, okay? If you take the numbers that hit the two buildings, 11 and 175, the two towers, right? The flight numbers that hit the two towers, and you combine them in an act of union, synthesis. See, the, this is the thesis and the antithesis represented by the two pillars. You bring them together, and it totals 186 175 plus 11 is 186. Now, if you take that number as being the full energy or force of those two combined attacks, 11 and 175, meaning the flight numbers, and you have 186, what's 186 evenly divided? If you take that force and evenly distribute it between the two pillars, 186 divided by 2 is 90. So if you take half of it and put it on the left pillar, half of it, put it on the right pillar, and you understand 93 was the number supposed, supposed to hit the middle pillar, what are the chances that you would have 93 on every single building representing the tree of life, the temple of Solomon, the, the goddess principle, the truth, true care, the ladder to God, the tree of life, the ascension to higher level of awareness, symbolically depicted by these three buildings, all destroyed. Yet, 77 remains alone because the Pentagon was not destroyed. It's the 77 triumphing over the 93. And as we saw, 77 is actually the number 666 in a different form. And 93 is is the number 777 in a different form. So it's the triumph of the triple six or base consciousness over 93 or 777, which is higher consciousness. In other words, it's the triumph of the satanic principle over the divine. It's the triumph of opposition, fear, and dualism, duality consciousness, base consciousness over the forces of the divine 
that are at work in the universe and in our lives and remaining in a base state of consciousness, never climbing that ladder to higher awareness and never uh, working on ourselves to bring ourselves into alignment with that divine uh, essence, that divine spark that's within all of us. So the the overtones to this, the uh, entire ritual are so incredibly dark and incredibly satanic and really embody the complete psychopathic essence of the orchestrators of this event, which I call sorcerers of consciousness. You know, these people understand all of these different psychological elements, these uh, numerological elements. These are all archetypal forms. Everything ultimately reduces to number. Everything ultimately reduces to energy. Energy, number, and form. That's, that's what everything is. That's what it's comprised of. They're using these archetypal things to bring about their manifested result. And it's not good. It's extraordinarily dark. And you can see that by the final reduction of these numbers, that they're killing care. They're killing the will. They're killing love. They're killing the, the will to ascend. And they're replacing it with only care about the self, only five sense identification, only ego, which can ultimately create no change for the better. That's what the number 77 represents. Again, intellect combined with action, but with the goddess principle of true care deadened within the individual and no seeking for truth within the individual, just acting in a five sense way like a robot. And that's ultimately what they want. And that can only be brought about if we remain in the consciousness of fear. And ultimately that's what this entire traumatic ritual was about uh, injecting into the public consciousness and keeping it there. But uh, I think we're seeing the deeper aspects of this event emerge more and more and more and more people coming into better understanding of the real motivations for this event. And they cannot keep the truth back regarding this uh, forever. And more people are going to understand not only just the five sense uh, version, the five sense realities about what this event was really all for. They're going to see the higher aspects of it, the occult aspects of it much more clearly as uh, they progress to a better understanding of these people's perverted uh, belief systems and perverted aspects of, of, of uh, this original knowledge which was communicated in different uh, mystery tradition teachings. Again, the way they're using it is in a perverted form that is uh, there to control people, manipulate people, and act as a uh, uh, leveraging uh, of... Um, a knowledge differential, which they then convert into a power differential. But again, through the unoculting process of this information, we're going to take that differential away from them and level the playing field of power, so to speak, and we're ultimately going to take our power back through that knowledge. And um, that's really uh, what this entire event was about. And as we approach it, I think more people should try to turn attention. Not only, of course, they should keep attention on the five sense aspects of it because that's important to help people to understand what went down and to bring the people responsible to justice. But we need to understand that there is a correspondence principle at work, that this entire ritual was brought to human attention, was brought into manifestation to teach human beings all of the higher aspects of, of, of this. And it does it through form, through, through energy, through symbol, through words. It, it, it doesn't necessarily just, I, I should say not through words, really. It does it through form, through energy, and through symbol. It's a wordless language of communication. The universe doesn't just come out and say something to us, but it is always speaking to us. It doesn't use our language. It uses its universal language that is a language of archetypes, symbols, and number. And that's ultimately what we really need to grasp out of all of this is that the universe is ultimately telling us something through this event, that it, th this is a herald for change, and it's announcing you're in the period of transition. Which order are you going to be a part of? Are you going to be a part of the dark new world order or the light new world order? It's the ultimate Hegelian dialectic. Okay. If you want to look at it that way, it's the cosmic dialectic at work because the time for choice is upon us. Do we choose the way of darkness and suffering and pain or do we choose the light 
an ascension to a higher level of awareness. And I think that's what this entire ritual is heralding and asking us to make that choice for ourselves. So I'll wrap it up there. And uh, I want to you know, thank you for inviting me on to present this information. And hopefully the public will contemplate it long and hard and uh, come to their own understanding of this and uh, even add upon it and uh, you know, expound on it so that um, they can really help other people to come to an understanding of, of why, the why, uh, for this entire tragic event. So, Popeye, thank you. Mark, thank you for, uh, thank you for taking a, a ton of extra time out of your day to go over all this. I know the, the listeners appreciate it, and as I do myself. One of the reasons why I didn't interrupt you and, and I sat back and I just let you speak was because I myself was relearning a lot of the info that I've already learned myself and I've I've read it and heard you talk about this before and had multiple conversations with you about this but again we we on my path everyone's path uh we are all learning till the day we die we never stop learning and uh, I, I had to sit back and just listen again, and even though I know a lot of this stuff, it is still just amazing because when you see it, it's just like puzzle piece after puzzle piece falling into place. That's exactly right. It's amazing. No, nothing is accidental. When you understand that this is all the universe calling out to us and calling us out of our present condition and uh, telling us that we need to change. We need to admit that the path that we're on is not the right one and then take course corrective measures by an act of our own will to create that change. That's ultimately what the universe is saying to us through such a tragic event. And people should look at it, it, although it is very tragic and many lives were lost, we should look at it still as an opportunity to create positive and lasting change through the press for truth. This is all about telling us, are you going to stand up and speak for truth? Are you going to embody the goddess principle of the sacred feminine energy? Are you going to be a, 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 a dynamic expression of care and truth in the world? And that's what's going to make the human condition better. That's what the universe is saying to us through events like this. It's up to us whether we're actually listening. I agree. It's like uh, I've quoted Cooper many times. We are coming to a, a crossroads and we either evolve and enlighten ourselves and evolve spiritually, or we are going to go down uh, the path of total and complete tyranny. Like we have no imagination yes. of there, there. We can't even picture how bad it's going to get if we don't evolve because the universe is going to say, well, apparently you didn't learn and you need to go through another cycle of garbage. And this cycle is going to be 10 times as worse as the last cycle because you didn't learn. So now we have to make it harder to learn. Right. I mean, that's basically what's, what's going on. Lesson up. You ratchet it up to a, to a whole new level because you weren't paying attention. So here's the remedial class. That's exactly what's going to happen if we don't wise up at this level. Yes. The evolution of our of humanity of just consciousness relies on people waking up and starting with one simple word, no. That's right. And from there, it's just the domino effect. And you'd be surprised how much that'll change your life. And I've harped on that many a times, and so has Mark. And I don't want to keep poor Mark for too much longer. So, Mark, thank you again for... Uh, coming on and doing this special broadcast on the occult aspects of 9-11. Tell everybody uh, where uh, they can go check your website and your sure. podcasts out. You can visit my website at www.whatonearthishappening.com. I do a weekly radio show on Oracle Broadcasting every Sunday from 5 to 7 p.m. East Coast time. There's a full archive of all of the radio shows that I've done, uh, 122 of them to date on the uh, podcast uh, page of What on Earth is Happening. Just click on the podcast tab. And uh, I also am the organizer of the Free Your Mind Conference. You can check out the conference that we have coming up in April of 2013, April 25th, 26th, and 27th of 2013. Already have 19 confirmed speakers. Uh, I have 17 of their bios up on the site as it stands today. A couple more bios will be forthcoming over the next couple of days. You could check the website out at www.freeyourmindconference.com. Really 
excited about how this conference is shaping up for uh, April of next year. Um, be a part of it. Come on out to Philadelphia if you can and uh, meet some of these great speakers and hear what they have to say. Um, it's going to be a unique event, and I'm really proud of how it's shaping up so far. So uh, that's my information. Uh, hopefully people will check out my work in detail and um, you know, start from the beginning of the podcast is what I always recommend because it is information that has prerequisite knowledge. It's like building the foundation of a house. You can't build the upper floors before you build the foundation. And the earlier podcasts are foundational information uh, for which the understanding of later uh, information, uh, later podcasts have as a prerequisite, as prerequisite knowledge. So uh, uh, proceed in order is my suggestion. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, take that to heart and go and take a look at some of that information. And um, that will expand on your understanding of the events that are really taking place here uh, on this planet. So Popeye, again, thank you for the opportunity to come and present that. And I uh, want to say... Um, uh, goodbye for now, and uh, thanks uh, for everything that you do. Well, thanks again, Mark. Uh, you are a, a a true inspiration. Like as I said before, y- if there is ever a physical manifestation of Morpheus, you are him, at least to me. <laughs> I appreciate that so much, my friend.